Hello, everybody. I'm Raj. I'm Ashwin. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. Blood Cancer Talks is a podcast that's exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring in experts who have a pulse on the field, and we talk about the latest developments in biology and clinical management. Today, we have Dr. Adam Cohen, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Abramson Cancer Center. Dr. Cohen is an expert on all things CAR T-cell in multiple myeloma, which is a very exciting topic lately. And we will talk about the latest updates on CAR T-cell in multiple myeloma, especially the clinical trials of CAR T-cell in earlier lines of therapy. Before we start, Dr. Cohen, first of all, welcome to the show. For our audience, can you tell us a little bit about your clinical and research focus and your background? Of course. And, and first, thanks for inviting me to come on the show. So I'm a clinical investigator, a faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, where I help lead our immunotherapy program for myeloma. And my research is really focused on sort of clinical development, especially phase one studies of novel immune therapies, CAR T cells, bispecifics, and the like. All right. So before we jump in, I wanted to put in a brief plug for our initial CAR T cell episode in myeloma that was actually released last year in July 2022 with Dr. Surbhi Sidana from the Stanford University. For those who are not familiar with the landscape of CAR T cell therapy in multiple myeloma, that would be a really good episode to, to check out. To set the stage for this discussion, I wanted to mention that prior to the randomized control trials in earlier lines of therapy, both CAR T cells in myeloma, namely IDA cell or IDA captagen vicolucel and SILTA cell or SILTA captagen autolucel, were FDA approved for patients with four or more prior lines of therapy, that is highly refractory patients. And the median PFS with SILTA cell in that setting was roughly in the ballpark of three years, as we have seen recently in the ASCO 2023 meeting, and that with IDA cell was roughly in the ballpark of one year, albeit with differences in patient populations enrolled in these trials in terms of proportion of patients with high-risk fish, extramedullary disease, etc. So with that background, let's jump into a case. This is actually a real-world case that I saw in my clinic a couple of weeks ago. I changed some of the patient identifiers, obviously. So I'll go through the case and then we will go over the data. So this was a 65-year-old male who was diagnosed with standard risk multiple myeloma he had T1114 and was revised ISS stage 2 at diagnosis. So approximately three years ago, at that time, we were just starting to use a quadruplet. So he, he received DARA VRD, and the plan was initially for him to receive DARA VRD followed by autologous transplant. But after discussion of both IFM and determination results, he chose to defer transplant to first relapse and ended up receiving DARA VRD for a total of six to eight cycles, followed by LEN maintenance alone. And his first remission lasted for approximately about three to three and a half years. And recently he relapsed biochemically with also some new bone disease on PET CT and whole body MRI. And the depth of remission in first real, in first remission was actually, he was in CR, but he was MRD positive at 10 power minus six on adaptive. So a couple of things I wanted to note here that this patient is DARA exposed, but not DARA refractory. The last time he saw DARA was more than two years ago. And he's clearly LEN refractory because he's relapsing on LEN maintenance. And the initial plan before all of these new data was to administer DARA KD or ISA KD triplet for three to four cycles, followed by autologous transplant, since he did not undergo autologous transplant in first remission. But just as he was relapsing, data from two randomized trials came out, Karma 3 and Cartitude 4. And for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that both IDSL and SILTASL are approved in earlier lines of therapy, which hopefully it will be soon and we'll be faced with these questions. So this episode will stay relevant for a long time. So now we are facing a decision dilemma at this point, whether to proceed to an anti-CD38 antibody-based triplet like DARA KD or ISA KD followed by transplant, or should we go straight to SILTASL, for example? So this is a great segue to talk about the two recent trials, namely the Karma 3 and Cartitude 4. So let's jump into these trials. So Dr. Cohen, the first question is, what were the major differences in the patient population enrolled in these two studies? I mean, both these studies tried to capture patients with early relapse in earlier lines of therapy, but there were still major differences in the patient population overall. What were the key differences? Yeah, so that's a, a great point, actually. So even though these are both considered early relapse trials, as you said, the patient populations were different. The inclusion criteria for CARMA-3 was two to four prior lines, and there was a median of three prior lines in that study. CARTITUDE-4 is one to three prior lines with a median of two. But in addition, there were a lot of differences in terms of the exposures to different drugs. Uh, so for instance, in CARMA-3, it was really a more heavily treated population. Over 90% of patients had prior DARA or CD38 antibody and were refractory to that compared with only about a quarter of patients in CARTITUDE-4. 
triple class refractory patients, meaning refractory to a proteasome inhibitor, IMID, and a CD38, that was seen in almost two-thirds of patients in CARMA-3 compared to only about 14% in CARTITUDE-4. And then pomalidomide refractoriness was seen in, in half the patients in CARMA-3 compared to only, I think, less than 5% in CARTITUDE-4. And there also were, were a higher numerically percentage of patients with high-risk cytogenetics and extramedullary disease and high tumor burden in CARMA-3. So even though they're both early line, they're really not comparable populations. And I think we have to look at them as really two different relapsed populations of patients. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of major differences. Now let's speak about the control arm a little bit. So just for the audience in Karma 3, the control arm, I think, was a little bit more heterogeneous. They had many options, including Darapom Dex, Ixazomib, Revlimid Dex, Kyprolis Dex, and Elopom Dex. And in Cartitude 4, it was a little bit cleaner. So it was either Darapom Dex or Pomalidomide Velcade Dex, and about 85% of patients received Darapom Dex. So it was pretty much Siltacil versus Darapom Dex trial. So, you know, one of the reg regimen that was not in the control arm was an anti-CD38 antibody plus carfilzomib dex, which is, as we know, one of the most active regimens in early relapse. Do you think if DARA-KD or ISA-KD was in the control arm, some of the benefit of CAR-T would have been attenuated or, you know, maybe the trial would have been negative or do you think the trials would still be positive? Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit hard to speculate. I, I definitely think some of the benefit might have been attenuated, especially in, in the CARTITUDE 4 where patients were all LEN refractory but didn't have to be PI refractory. And so you might have seen, I guess, maybe a little bit better performance of the control arm with a carfilzomib CD38 combo. It's important to remember, though, that, the, you know, the studies that, that support those agents, the Candor and Ikema studies, they also were not quite the same population as what got enrolled in these trials, right? So only about a third of patients in those trials were LEN refractory compared to 100% LEN refractory in CARTITUDE 4. Um, and, and there were other sort of differences in terms of exposure. They obviously were all naive to a CD38 antibody. So it's, it's really hard to, to cross compare with these different trials um, because the, the populations are a little bit different and that, that often makes a difference. But, but your point is well taken. You know, the, the median PFS with those regimens and those trials was two and a half, three years. Um, so it, they might have done better if those were included in the standard of care in these studies. Yeah, and we will definitely come to the efficacy and toxicity later. But in my mind, even if they were similar, as we know, the dara and isa -KD is pretty hard to give. Patients have to come in once a week for indefinitely, two years, three years. So even if they were similar, I, I would you know be biased more to use car t which is a one and done but that's a that's a different point so right. you know as you know the median time from leukapheresis to infusion in idisol was uh, in in karma 3 was about 49 days and in cartitude 4 i found in the supplement it was around 79 days so it was significantly higher almost 30 days higher in in cartitude 4 and this is similar to our experience in the real world that siltacil the manufacturing time has been longer as well so do you think that will influence of your choice of therapy for a particular patient if you had both available you know knowing that one has a you know longer vein to vein time yeah I, you know, and as you said, we struggle with this in the real world as well. I, I don't think that influences choice right now, because to be honest, the choices, are they progressing so fast that they're not going to make it to a car infusion at all and I need to go to a bi-specific, or do I think I can, I can stabilize them for the amount of time I need to manufacture? And so whether it's four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, if I think I can hold them and I have a good bridging option, I don't think the extra time is going to impact choice. What I thought was interesting, though, I saw that in the supplement as well. It was 79 days, you know, for sort of vein to vein, but the time to product availability or product release was only 44 days in the Cartitude 4. So there was some disconnect there where the product was ready, but it took another 30 days. And they mentioned that they thought they said it was due to delays rec related to COVID. That was sort of a line in the paper. So maybe it won't quite be 11 weeks, you know, in, in the real world. And in our experience, it's been closer to eight weeks or so vein to vein with Siltacel. Yeah, I think that's a good point that, you know, if you can wait 49 days, then you can maybe also wait till 79 days because those who are really aggressively, rapidly progressing, you can't even wait 49 days. I mean, those probably need something else like right. bispecifics or chemo. All yeah. right. Now, now let's turn to efficacy. Um, Dr. Cohen, can you tell us a top line results for progression-free survival with CAM3 as well as Catitude 4? Yes. So for CARMA-3, which was the more heavily pretreated population, the, the key results that the IDA cell did meet the primary endpoint of improving progression-free survival, the median PFS was 13.3 months, 
versus 4.4 months for the standard of care arm with a hazard ratio of 0.49. And so that did meet the primary endpoint. For CARTITUDE 4, the median progression free survival was not reached for cell to cell. It was 11.8 months for the standard of care. The hazard ratio was 0 0.26. So even better reduction in the risk of progression or death in that particular study. So those were sort of the main top line results in terms of a primary endpoint. So similar to the later line studies, we saw that CELTA cell performed much better than IDA cell in terms of CR rate as well as median PFS. With caveat of cross-trial comparisons, are you convinced that CELTA cell is a superior product compared to IDA cell? That's, that's a, a really key question here. And so, you know, I think if we just look at these two randomized studies, it, it's really hard to make those comparisons for the reason we just talked about. The populations are very different. But if you look on, on the whole of all the data with these products, you have the, the BB2121 phase one, which then turned into Idacel and Karma, the original phase two that got it approved, and then this Karma three. And then you look at all of the, the uh, Silta cell studies from the original legend study in China, CART one, there is this consistent improved depth of response with Silta cell. The CR rates are usually almost double in all of those trials, and the duration of response seems greater as well. And so Yes, with all of the caveats about cross-trial comparisons, we're, we're getting this continued signal that you're getting deeper emissions with cell to cell, it seems like, regardless of the population, and that seems to be, you know, translating to more durable remissions. And, and so, yes, I, I do think there's going to be, there is a real efficacy difference. I, you know, I'm getting convinced of that as we're seeing more data emerge, but we don't have the head-to-head. -head. I have to, to say that for, you know, we don't know for sure. Yeah, and also the real-world data, I think, can also help us in this regard. I know the Silta Cell real-world data was presented at ASCO as poster. I'm really looking forward to the manuscript because in the trials, as you mentioned, the patient population was so different. But I'm hoping that in real-world data, the patient population would be similar because it was mostly a matter of chance. Like some centers were IDSL centers, some were Silta Cell. And mm -hmm. we rarely had the luxury of being able to choose between, you know, having both products available and having to choose one over the other. At least most centers, maybe some centers, Interested, but most of us did not have that luxury. So maybe the real world data will throw more light on the comparative efficacy. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I think that there's both strengths and weaknesses to the real world data. And, and you know, you mentioned selection bias being one or sort of, but, but I think larger numbers are important. I think the fact that in those real world experiences, you know, over half the patients wouldn't have qualified for these studies, which I also think is important. It's sort of reflective of the actual patients that we're seeing in our clinics. And so, yes, as those numbers grow and we start to really drill down and compare, maybe pick patient populations that seem very comparable in terms of lines of therapy and cytogenetics, et cetera, then we can get a little bit more of a head-to-head. -head. So I agree with you there. And as you know, we do not have overall survival data yet, but it seems that there were a slightly higher early deaths from non-relapse mortality in CAR T arms in both trials, for example, 14 versus 6 in CAR 3 and 10 versus 5 in CARTITUDE. This will most likely be overcome by a higher number of deaths from myeloma progression in the control arms at later time points. How does this influence your choice of therapy for early relapse patients? Would you reserve CAR T only for high risk patients or those with aggressive relapse? Yeah, this is a great point, and I think it's something we really need to look into more. There also were, were fairly high levels of, of non-relapse mortality in some of those real-world experiences that, that you mentioned as well, as high as, as 10% in some cases, mostly infectious, sometimes related to CRS or HLH and other things. So would I reserve it only for high risk or those with aggressive relapse? It, it's, it's a great question and one that I, I probably am still working through myself. Maybe initially, like until, because we don't have overall survival data yet, so we're really just looking at PFS data and sort of response rate data. And so until some of that survival data matures, the people that I'm thinking about using this certainly, you know, very early on might be the folks that have aggressive disease in terms of biology, high-risk cytogenetics. They're relapsing within 12 months of their initial therapy. Folks you expect to do poorly with our standard treatments. But we have to be careful there because... I also think there's a signal that, you know, more rapidly growing disease, high tumor burden is also a risk factor for more toxicity. So you also don't want to only limit it to people with sort of exploding disease. I actually think the better time to use CAR T cells are, are patients who have some modicum of good disease control, um, where you have good bridging options, where you're going to be able to maintain their tumor burden at a low level. 
And so not waiting too long, I think is also important. So that's a long-winded way of not really answering your question, but I'm not going to reserve it, I think, only for high-risk patients, but I'm going to I'm going to favor those patients initially, I think. And then once we get more survival data and more data on these non-relapse mortality, second malignancies, et cetera, um, you know, if we're more comfortable that that's not eating in too much to the survival advantage, and I'm, I think we're going to be using it for, for a lot more patients. Finally, a big picture question. As you know, there was a lot of hope that using CAR-T in earlier lines of therapy would lead dramatically better outcome and perhaps cure some patients. Are you content or disappointed with the results of these two trials? Hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's it's funny. If this was just you know any sort of new drug product that came out and had these type of results, everybody would be going crazy that this would be such a home run. I think our expectations were ratcheted up so high for CAR T cells that we're sort of like, oh, ho-hum, it's, you know, got it, the, the PFS is three years. I, I, I guess I don't know. I think for Karma 3, that's been criticized. Oh, the PFS isn't that much greater than it was in later lines. But biologically, those patients honestly don't look that different to me than the original Karma study, even though they have fewer lines of therapy. So I, I, I feel like moving it up didn't, uh, we didn't maybe move it up enough in that particular trial to, to, to see a difference. And I think what's going to be interesting in Cartitude 4 is, what those PFS curves look like longer uh, term, and is there going to start to be any sort of plateau seen? I think one of the interesting things that was in the presentation that I saw at ASCO, and, and maybe in the supplement, was you know comparing one prior line versus two or three prior lines, and the curves are pretty for silta cell, for instance, and and the curves are pretty similar through 12 months, and then they're starting to separate out a little bit going further, and so you know to really get the benefit of moving it up earlier and and maybe healthier T cells, you know maybe even third line, fourth line is, is, is too late. We got to go second line or, or even earlier. Um, so I am, uh, I, I'm not fully content, but I'm not too disappointed either. I'm as I should be right now with these and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that curve, I saw that in ASCO. I, I was looking for it in supplement, but I couldn't find it. But yeah, that was, uh, I think it would be good to look at by different lines of treatment as, you know, the data matures with longer follow-up specifically. Right, if it really starts to, to separate out and then there really is a benefit from doing it first line or, or second line. And then, as you know, there were ongoing trials doing this even as consolidation of frontline therapy. Yeah. All right. So we'll next turn to the toxicity. And we, in our prior episode, we had discussed in detail the CRS and ICANS with, with CAR T cell therapy. Do you think there was any major difference in CRS and ICANS incidence in these trials versus the seminal trials in later line settings that led to the earlier approvals of Ida cell and Silta cell? Yeah. So for Ida cell, the, the, the CRS rates didn't seem that different to me. Their CRS frequency was maybe a little bit lower in the CARTITUDE 4 compared to CARTITUDE 1, but still the vast majority of patients are getting CRS. Um, fortunately, this continues to be primarily low grade and uh, the rates of high grade three or four CRS is generally under under 5% and some of the studies under 3%. And I think similarly with, the, uh, with ICANs, ICANs there really were not significant differences between the two studies. There, there maybe was a little bit of uh, lower high-grade ICANs in CARTITUDE 4 compared to CARTITUDE 1, probably reflecting a little bit lower tumor burden. And as we'll talk about, you know, some changes in the non-ICANs-related neurotoxicity, which I'm sure is a topic you're going to get to. <laughs> I, I definitely wanted to get to that because, you know, now we are using Silta cell, it's FDA approved and sometimes patients go back to the community oncologist after three months, the first hundred days. And um, these non ICANS neurotoxicities that have been described with Silta cell and also in, I believe in the package insert of Ida cell, some of them, but they were initially not, we, we didn't know about that, you know, much initially with Ida cell, but in Silta cell, definitely the incidence has been higher. So can you comment on what are the key non icans neurotoxicity with Silta cell that have been described and maybe some of your real world tips on how to manage them and how do you approach them in your practice? Sure. I think there, there's three main ones that, that have been described. The, the one that's sort of the most worrisome has been the Parkinsonian, also called movement and neurocognitive disorders. And this was, as you mentioned, initially described in the CARTITUDE 1 study it, with later updates. Now it's actually six patients out of the original 97 treated, um, including one that, that developed it as, as late as two and a half years. But, uh, but most of the time these have developed, you know, within the, the first few months, the median time for these other neurotoxicities is, is around 27 to 28 days. And this has been challenging. We had one of the first patients in the trial as did Mount Sinai. And initially we were hitting these patients with really aggressive immune suppression. 
because they had persistent CAR T cells circulating, they had CAR T cells in their CSF. And then unfortunately that didn't really seem to help. In fact, the, these, these patients not only didn't get better, but they, they both died of infectious complications because they were so immune suppressed. And so the first thing that's been I noted is that the, the risk factors for this seem to be high tumor burden with growing disease at time of infusion. They all interestingly were males and, and Caucasian. They all had prior high grade CRS, many had prior ICANs and they had high CAR persistence. And so honestly, we, we don't know the best way to treat this when it occurs. What, what we've been doing when we see it, and fortunately it's much less common in, in sort of the real world experience or in the later studies, less than 1%, is often a short course of steroids, either you know, pulse dex or in some cases a, a few days of hydrosolumedrol and also IVIG is an immune modulating agent, and then time and just supportive care. And it seems that many of these patients um, some of them will improve, although not all the way to baseline, and some will stabilize, but at least not worsen. And so we, we've actually taken a little bit of a less is more approach with it. And, and I don't think we still un fully understand the mechanism. The Mount Sinai group had a very nice paper um, sort of suggesting BCMA expression in a subset of these patients within the basal ganglia. I don't, that hasn't fully been confirmed, but I think that's one of the, the possibilities here. So that's the Parkinsonian disorders. What's more common are actually cranial nerve palsies, and, and that was seen in CARTITUDE 4 as well, and can be seen as many as 9 to 10% of patients with cell-to-cell and also has been described with other CARs as well. And, and again, sort of a Bell's palsy, a 7 nerve palsy is most common. These tend to be mild. You can either leave it alone and get it better, or, or again, sometimes we'll give a short course of, of dexamethasone, and often these uh, in, improve on their own within a few weeks. And then lastly has been some patients with peripheral neuropathies, and these can uh, be either sensory or sensory motor neuropathies. And this is interesting because this is also described, as you may recall, with the BCMA bispecifics. And the original AMG 420 study, you know, saw this at the highest doses. And again, we don't really have a great idea of the mechanism of this, but uh, when they've occurred, again, sometimes a short course of steroids, but mostly supportive care. And again, some of these are reversible, others are, are not. And it's a little bit idiosyncratic right now. Yeah, so for the Parkinsonism, the movement disorders, the typical Parkinson's disease treatment doesn't seem to work here, right? Like the Cinemet, for example, Carbidopa, Levodopa, have those, has those been tried in these patients? Yeah, so our experience has been that those have not worked. And, and I believe that was the experience at some of the other patients as well in, in CARTITUDE 1. Interestingly, in the, uh, the one patient in CART 4 that had this, they mentioned in the supplement, the patient got Carbidopa, Levodopa. But they didn't really say if it, if it helped or not. But no, it doesn't seem, at least in our hands, it hasn't really worked. And, and so it seems to be somewhat different mechanistically. Yeah. Right. So while we do not yet have a really long-term follow-up, you know, but both with both Karma 3 and Cartitude 4, there is still in supplement in both trials have shown some cases of MDS AML in the CAR-T arm, whereas none in the control arm. Do you think this is a real signal that might get worse on long-term follow-up? And, and what do you think the cause is? Do you think it's primarily the lymphodepleting chemo or, or the CAR-T also playing a role? Um, what are your thoughts on the signal of second primary malignancies? Yeah, this is a great point as well. And uh, definitely in the, in the, you know, the, the later line studies, uh, there have been a number of these seen. And CARTITUDE 1, with each follow-up, there tends to be a, a few more. I think there are up to I think 20 patients now in CART-1 have had a second malignancy, including multiple cases of MDS and a few cases of AML. In that setting, I was really attributing it to very heavily pretreated patients getting fludarabine-based therapy and you know, might have already had CHIP or some predisposition to it, and then we exacerbated it. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see in these, these other studies what that signal is going to be if this was just a one-off. There's only been one or two cases so far. But yes, I, I am, I guess, somewhat concerned about it. I don't think it would preclude me from obviously giving this. I suspect it's maybe related to the to the lymphodepleting chemotherapy plus some sort of inflammatory milieu that we're inducing in these patients with, who may have some, again, already mutational burden or genetic predisposition to it. So, you know, we're sort of fueling the fire a little bit there. And the hope is by doing it earlier, we're going to have a, a, a lower incidence of this, but I, I think we'll just have to wait and see. 
Yeah, so we want to go to the GPRC 5D CAR T next, but before that, I wanted to uh, bring up a recent paper in blood cancer discovery by your group, by Dr. Garfal et al., that reported on the safety and efficacy of a dual CAR, a BCMA and CD19 CAR, followed by image maintenance in patients with early relapse or those responding to initial therapy, including very high risk patients. Most of the patients had one or two high risk abnormalities. So I really loved reading that paper. The discussion was so well written, and it's really an excellent read for those who haven't read it. So what are the key lessons to be learned from that trial? Even though it was a small trial, it was not practice changing, but I think there are a lot of important lessons to be learned and that's where the discussion was great. Uh, can you tell us for the audience, what are the key lessons to be learned from that trial? Sure. So yeah, so this was a trial uh, led by my colleague Al Garfala Penn, who was using a sort of in-house BCMA car that we had co-developed with Novartis that is not going forward in development, but we had access to. And then with a, some patients got a, a second humanized CD19 car product. So it was not a bi-specific bi -specific car, but actually two separate manufactured products that were infused at the same time. With hypothesis that there may be a CD, you know, a, a myeloma stem cell hiding within the CD19 component compartment. Um, and so first we had to do a, a safety run in giving both cars to a patient so that were uh, relapsed refractory, although not as heavily refractory as our initial trial, median of three and a half prior lines. And then we took newly diagnosed patients who were in a response but had high-risk features, as you said, and then 10 of them got the BCMA car alone and 10 got BCMA car plus CD19 car. And then we also had the option to add imid maintenance in. And so I think, uh, as, as you mentioned, there were a few key things we learned. So one, unfortunately, the CD19 component of the car did not seem to have a major impact on depth of response, duration of response. And so whether that has to do with the car we chose, the patients, or that CD19 is not a good target for this putative myeloma stem cell. But at least in our, in our hands, in our studies, it didn't have a, a major impact. I think what was very important was that these patients were all in a response going into treatment, and so they had low tumor burden to begin with, and the toxicities we saw were certainly much less than what we saw in our original phase one trial with the same BCMA CARP product in heavily refractory patients, where there was much larger tumor burden progressing disease. So CRS rates were similar, but far lower high-grade CRS. In fact, only one patient required TOSI. Only one patient had ICANs in the entire study. And so that, that, that really has influenced me about this whole idea of using CARs more of as a consolidation of a, in a responding patient rather than waiting until they relapse. In addition, the use of IMIDs was safe, and so this was the first study that really had explored and, and published on that, that we could give lenalidomide or pomalidomide as early as 30 days, although the median time to start was, was closer to 60 days. And we actually saw re-expansion of CARs in a subset of patients that were associated with a clear response that had really not been seen just after their CARs alone. They sort of plateaued, you added the IMID, and they went down. And some of those patients had, had sort of no longer were responding to the IMIDs going in. So I do think there's some synergy there. And uh, the, the patients who were more likely to respond to that actually had some sort of better parameters of T-cell fitness at baseline, a better CD4, CD8 ratio, and other such things. So, so I thought that was an interesting lesson as well. And then the last one that sort of came out of this was that BCMA expression, which we had previously published was dynamic sort of post-CAR T-cell treatment and, and was going down in many of our patients on their residual myeloma cells. We actually saw low BCMA expression on the patients coming into the study, even before they got a BCMA-targeted treatment. And so this was suggesting that just having some residual disease after your induction therapy, that that may be a BCMA low reservoir, and that that may represent sort of a, a population that's resistant to multiple therapies. And so it just raised this question, is that going to be harder to really eradicate those, those, link, those small amounts of minimal residual disease, even with a, a, a more potent BCMA CAR? You know, our BCMA car that we used in retrospect is not as potent, I think, as Siltacel and some of these other ones. And so that was one limitation of the study. But it just raised these questions of biology that I think are going to become more germane as we start to do correlative analyses on some of these larger studies with the commercial products. Yeah, and one of the trials I'm really looking forward to is the Cartitude 6, which will probably take a long time to read out, Siltacel versus autotransplant. It's a good control arm. We have DARA-VRD induction and then Siltacel versus autotransplant, and there is Revlimid maintenance for two years. So there is a good control arm, good initial treatment. I think that will be the real test for Siltacel. If it can beat autotransplant in that setting, that will, I think, uh, really be exciting, but we'll see right. what happens. And that'll get to some of these questions about treating low-level disease, et cetera. 
And one other point I'll make is that we, we did see good car expansion, even in the absence of large amount of antigen burden there. So I thought that was a, a, a nice lesson also from, from Al's trial. Yeah. Now switching gears, let's imagine a scenario where the patient got Celta cell for first relapse and had a PFS of two years. At the two-year time point, he relapses biochemically with the Ryzen free light chains. Imaging shows worsening bone disease and there's a drop in hemoglobin. At this point, uh, the GPR C5D CAR T is being considered as a next line therapy on a clinical trial. With that segue, let's talk about current data on the GPR C5D CAR T cell therapy. I think that recently data um, published by uh, MSKCC, a phase one trial on 19 patients uh, with approximately 50% having received prior BCMA CAR T therapy, uh, high risk cohort overall with 95% refractory to bridging therapy, and then more than 90% TCR, and more than 80% refractory to first line therapy. Can you comment on the top line efficacy data of this CAR T therapy from this paper? Yes, yeah, so actually there was the original paper, the, the trial from Sloan Kettering, which was sort of an in-house trial. This was the GPRC 5 d CAR developed by Eric Smith there, and then Sham Malankati published in the England Journal. And then at EHA, there was actually a, a multi-center study of this car that's now, I guess, licensed to, and so the, to BMS, and the trial was run by BMS. And, and both showed very impressive efficacy, I thought, in a very refractory, tough-to-treat population. And so the, uh, the initial phase one at Sloan Kettering, they treated, I think, ended up 17 patients got treated. The response rate was around 70%, and 35% had CRs. And they actually saw fairly similar activity in terms of response rates between the BCMA treatment exposed and the BCMA treatment naive. And, and most of those patients, I think eight of them had had prior BCMA CAR. And the duration of response was somewhere around median duration of response, about eight months, at least in, in that initial experience. In terms of the EHA presentation, I didn't see that, but I was able to, to get the slides. And so that's a multi-center study with the same CAR, also very heavily pretreated population of patients. And about, again, 45% of them had had a prior BCMA treatment, and a third of them had had a prior BCMA CAR. I think they reported on 67 treated patients and 50-something had efficacy data. And again, very impressive, 86% response rates um, and CR rates that I, I believe are were closer to 50% or so. And so clearly GPRC5D CARs are active. There's actually been two Chinese trials that have been published with GPRC5D CARs and showing very similar efficacy. So it does seem like you um, can rescue a patient even after a prior BCMA car with a, a GPRC5D car, which I, I thought was really nice to see now in multiple studies. Now let's talking about safety. Any major differences in CRS or ICANS rate between GPRC5D and BCMA CAR T cell therapy that stood out to you? Not really. The, the rates of CRS were were fairly high, you know, 85, 90% for the GPRC5D studies. And so to me, that didn't seem that different. The, uh, the rates of high grade were also still relatively low as they are in most myeloma CAR trials. And same with ICANs, the, the, the rates of ICANs in these studies tended to be on the five to 10% range with, without, again, a, a increased signal of high grade ICANs. So at least for, for those two toxicities, not really seeing much difference. And compared to BCMA cars, any differences in incidence of prolonged cytopenia beyond 30 or 60 day post infusion? Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure we have enough data there yet. I know in the, the EHA abstract, th there was mentioned a couple of DLTs of patients with some prolonged cytopenias, but I don't recall actually seeing absolute numbers of patients with cytopenias that were really prolonged beyond 30 or 60 days. So I uh, probably just need a little bit more time to get some of that data before we can conclude. Another major uh, challenge with GPRC5 targeting is the skin and nail changes, which is an issue across the board with all the GPRC5 based products. Any differences in kinetics or reversibility of these toxicities between GPRC5 CAR T and talcatamab? So it's interesting. So all the GPRC5 D targeted therapies do cause these issues. And so patients can develop rash, they can have nail changes, this dysgesia, dry mouth that can be very challenging for some patients. A lot of them have weight loss. 
I guess what I've noticed, and, and again, it's, it's small numbers and you're comparing across trials, but the frequency of these does seem to be a bit lower to me in the gprc 5 cars versus the, the bispecifics, both talquetamab and ferintamig, the other gprc 5 bi bispecific. The skin toxicities and nail beds can be seen in more than half or two thirds of patients with the bispecifics, and you're not seeing that level of frequency with the CARS. In addition, I believe it was in the, the Sloan Kettering trial, the, the time to these toxicities maybe was a little bit longer for whatever reason. It was like a median time to three months for the nail changes. And again, at least in my anecdotal experience, it, it seems to come on a little faster. The durability or duration of it may also be different, right? Because the, the bispecifics you're continuing to give, and so patients may continue to have some of these toxicities where the CAR T cells are not persisting beyond a few months, and then some of these toxicities are expected to resolve. So I do think there's going to be some differences in the kinetics and, and duration. I think we need a little bit more follow-up because the follow-up is shorter so far on the CAR T trials. And I think it's interesting that the, the incidence of these may be a little lower, <laughs> with CAR T than with the bispecifics, but I think we need to sort of wait and see. Yeah, I think it will be really interesting if it's more reversible with CAR T because I think the, these side effects have a lot of impact on quality of life and which may be a barrier to bringing talcoetamab in earlier lines of treatment because of the quality of life impact. And if, if we see that with GPRC 5D CAR T because it's one and done, maybe it's more reversible, that would be really good for patients. And definitely that would make us choose CAR-T over by specifics in, in this, for this particular target, at least. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I've had some patients on the, the by specifics where their, their myeloma is doing great, but they're miserable. They just, their mouth is so dry and they, they don't want to eat. We usually manage it with dose holds and dose reductions. You get them through it. But what patients in very late line refractory myeloma are willing to put up with is different than what people in first or second line may be willing to put up with when they have many other options. I agree. I think that's going to be really important. Can you comment on cerebellar toxicity that was seen in two patients receiving the 450 million dose? Do you think cerebellar toxicity will be a major barrier for this product moving into earlier lines of therapy? So this was really interesting and I think unexpected because it hadn't been described with the bi-specifics, but in the Memorial Sloan Kettering trial, as they got to their highest dose of 450 million cells, they had two DLTs of patients who developed dizziness, ataxia, broad-based gait, and what, what really looked like cerebellar changes, cerebellar findings, basically. They had negative MRIs. One of them had did have some low-level CAR T cells seen in the CSF uh, on an LP, and the timing was different. One patient developed it after two to three weeks and one after five months. In, in both cases, they, they, were, they did treat the patients with steroids, in some cases IVIG, and they stabilized, but it didn't seem like it fully reversed. And they did some nice work, again, looking at the Allen Brain Atlas, saying, showing that perhaps there is some expression, at least gene expression, in the inferior olivary nucleus involved in sort of climbing fibers of signaling to the cerebellum. In the, uh, the multicenter study presented at EHA, I, I saw, again, at least on the toxicity slide, there was one, one case that, that sounded like cerebellar toxicity, though I don't know what the details were, if that was really described in the presentation. It has not been described with the, in the Chinese trials of gprc 5 d cars. It has not been described, to my knowledge, with ferimtimig or talquetamab. So as with Parkinsonian-like toxicity for DCMA, this is sort of a, a very a rare and unusual one that may be related to aberrant expression that's unmasked in certain patients. I think we need to learn a little bit more. And it does seem to be a little bit dose-dependent. And, and so what was nice about the... Uh, the trial that was presented at EHA, which is the multi-center trial with the gprc 5 car, is that they saw very good activity even at lower doses, far lower than 450. And so it's possible that they're able to find a dose where you get efficacy and maybe a, a lower risk of this cerebellar toxicity. So I, I don't know if it's going to be a major barrier. I think it, it's a little too soon. I think we'll have to wait and see as we treat more numbers. My hope, though, is that this is something that's that's very uncommon and, and won't be a barrier, but I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. All right. So before we move on from gprc 5 d CAR-T, one interesting finding in the MSK paper was that four out of six patients who progressed after having an initial response, they had no gprc 5 d expression at progression. And similarly, I found in the small phase one Polaris trial from China that was published in the Lancet Hematology, one out of two patients that relapsed at negative GPRC5D expression. So to my knowledge, at least with BCMA, we haven't really seen 
the loss of BCM expression that commonly, although these are low number of patients overall. So can you tell us about how does this compare with BCMA CAR T and do you think the mechanism of resistance would be different with GPRC 5D versus BCMA? For example, more antigen escape with GPRC 5D versus BCMA. Right. So I, uh, I agree with your assessment that at least uh, at first glance, it seems like we're seeing it a little bit more often. You know, again, it's small numbers, but it seems like a higher proportion of patients when, when they've looked for loss of antigen, they found it. Uh, and this is in contrast to the, with the BCMA CAR T experience, where again, as we described in others, most of the time BCMA may go down, but comes back up. There have been a, a few cases of patients with biallelic true genomic loss, but the vast majority of patients in CARMA 1 and, and also in CARMA 3, when they relapsed, they still had evidence for BCMA expression, at least through soluble BCMA levels. And I do, and this is all speculation, but uh, we know BCMA actually plays a role in, in myeloma pathogenesis. It provides a survival and proliferation signal. And so there may be a, a disadvantage to losing BCMA, whereas we don't really know if GPRC has any function on myeloma cells. We actually don't know the function at all. And so I, I wonder if we may be, see more sort of mutant, uh, escape mutants with, with loss of GPRC5D. And in fact, um, there's already been reports, I think, through Nazar Bayless's lab and Leo Rash, uh, they're seeing mutations in GPRC5D emerge with the bispecifics, perhaps a little bit more frequently even than BCMA. So I think it's a great question. I do worry that this may become a, a common mechanism of, of loss and so that antigen escape may be more of an issue with GPRC5D than BCMA, but I think it's, it's a little early. It's probably still speculation. All right. So the last topic we want to touch upon very briefly is the allocar, given there have been some new publications in, in the past few months. Uh, so let's briefly touch upon the phase one universal trial that was published in Nature Medicine, I believe, a few months ago uh, by Dr. Mylan Cody from Sloan Kettering. So for the audience, this was a phase one trial of ALO715, which is a first in class allogeneic anti-BCMA CAR T-cell therapy, along with lymph lymphodepletion with flu sci, and along with that, they also used an anti-CD52 antibody-containing regimen developed by the same company was ALO647, so it was similar to alemtuzumab. So Dr. Cohen, what were the key takeaways on efficacy and toxicity of ALO715? So I think that the first key takeaway was that it worked, right? This was the first allogeneic CAR product to, to really show results in, in myeloma and, and there was a lot of gene uh, modification that was that was made to this product so that it didn't express CD52 so you could use the, the camp path like molecule it lacked a T cell receptor so it wouldn't cause GVH and so we, we didn't really really know if this would be rejected right away or if it would work and so they did see CAR T expansion they did see activity um, they're looking at several different dose levels and still trying to optimize the lymphodepletion my takeaway was I thought it was nice proof of concept that this could work and that they saw responses in the typical heavily refractory population of patients. The response rates and depth of response to me were, I guess, a little underwhelming compared to what we had seen with some of the autologous CAR products, again, with the caveat of comparing across trials. And the, the durability of response, I think, was, again, a little bit of a mixed bag with, with some patients having durable remissions, but, but others not. And, and so I think it, it was a, a, a nice proof of concept I'm interested in sort of seeing more like this, and there are a number of these different ones that are being developed right now. But I, I also worry a little bit about the, the toxicity with this, and, and that's primarily, I think, infectious because of the need for the additional immune suppression, right? And you're coming in with flu sci and a CD52 antibody. I think you're really going to put your patients at risk of viral infections and possibly fungal and other opportunistic infections. So I think I'm, I, I was more excited about these initially before we saw the great data with bispecifics. The question is, if you already have an off-the-shelf product that can get you responses in a large proportion of patients, what's the role going to be for these allogeneic CAR T cells? I think that's a question that we still don't know the answer to, but I also think this is the first generation of these, and there's probably going to be additional tweaks scientifically to, to improve them. Yeah, the infection toxicity is definitely a concern, as you alluded to. There was, I think, one death from fungal pneumonia in that trial and, and one death from, I think, adenovirus, if I remember correctly. So definitely a lot of infections, which we typically don't see in myeloma because of T-cell ablation with the flu sci and anti-CD52 antibody. Right. And you're targeting BCMA, right, which yes. we know takes out your, you know, your plasma cells and, and some portion of B cells. So you're sort of adding all of this in, uh, immune paresis, if you will, or immune suppression together. So you really have to be cautious in these patients. They need a lot of prophylaxis. 
So I think we'll we'll wait and see. Yeah. All right. I think we covered a lot, most of the major recent trials on CAR-T. Just going back to the case that we started with. So let's say if you had this patient in your clinic today, and let's say the CAR-Ts are approved for earlier lines of treatment, and the patient, let's say, did not have transplant earlier and deferred transplant to first relapse, would you would you still do the transplant and save CAR-T for the next line, or would you just go to CAR-T and omit transplant altogether? <laughs> Yeah, so when I, I heard that case, I was trying to think about what I would actually do. Obviously, I'm a CAR-T enthusiast, um, but I, I also tend to be somewhat conservative, and I, 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 I'm a late, somewhat of a late adapter in, in that I'd like to see longer-term follow-up and longer data before I really change something that's tried and true. I mean, we know from the IFM you know, 2009 study that if you get transplant early or late, that the eight-year survival in, in those patients, especially with standard risk disease as this patient had, was really good. And so in terms of durability of remissions, I still think there's more data supporting a, a stem cell transplant approach. And I can't believe I'm saying that, but that's that I would have a discussion with the patient, but if that was the original plan, as you proposed in the patient, a DKD followed by transplant, I think you probably have more data supporting that right now than CARS. But if you come back to me in another six months or a year, I probably, I, I may change my mind completely as we see longer follow-up and survival data from these studies. Yeah, absolutely. And many of these patients who I'm sure you see, we also face this in clinic that uh, many of these patients who defer transplant, they defer with the hope that something new will come along the way and maybe they will not need transplant altogether. And now many of my patients who are in first remission and defer transplant, they're talking about these trials and they're really excited that maybe they can get CAR-T at first relapse. And it's going to be very, it's a long discussion now at first relapse. There's so many options that, you know, which therapy to choose for which patient is becoming a challenge. It is. And I'd say, so for patients who already had a transplant, but still have stem cells in the bank, I definitely push salvage auto transplant further and further down the line, right? I think we're yeah. probably all doing that. If we have all of these great new immune therapies, I'm not willing to go to high-dose melphalan again until I've exhausted a lot of these other things. But if you've never had high-dose melphalan at all, and, and again, you have stem cells collected and you deferred it for this reason, it's still a very effective myeloma therapy that can get very durable remission. So uh, again, we just don't, we don't have a trial in this particular scenario for this patient. So it's all going to be extrapolation. And the, the trial you mentioned up front of head to head transplant versus CAR T will probably inform that decision because we'll probably extrapolate it to later lines as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I think it was a great discussion and we really went into the weeds of CAR T cell therapy in multiple myeloma. And we hope to have you back again sometime in future as more data emerges on CAR T cell therapy in myeloma. Absolutely. Thanks for the invitation to join you guys today. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Yeah.